Welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at interfacing with an analog world and we'll be looking at the general principles behind this important topic. We'll see exactly how important analog is in a moment and then we'll look at how you represent analog values inside a digital system like a computer. And that requires pulse code modulation. Getting values into a computer and out of a computer requires analog to digital conversion and digital to analog conversion respectively. So we'll look at that also as well as practicalities around this. The world is analog, it's important. Everything in the outside, well, outside a computer is measured in analog units. For example, I've got loudness in decibels, temperature in degrees, 36.8 means that you probably don't have COVID-19 at that point. Speeds, pressure, and so on. These are analog values, but the computer likes to represent things in digital values. Every computer you're going to use is digital. There are some analog ones that have existed in history, but are not really used in today's world. So because the world is analog and computers are digital, we need to convert between the two and also how we need to think of how to represent the values in these different domains. Now if we're talking about a single value, temperature yesterday for example, then when we store that in a computer we need to think about two things about that value that are important. Um, one is the range, how big or how small it can be, and the other one is the precision that we want to store. So I have an example here which is using a temperature that's between um, minus 99 to plus 999 degrees C and I've got a precision of plus or minus 0 0.01 degrees centigrade. Now if I'd said you wanted to represent a temperature from minus 99 to plus 999 and you wanted it represented to the nearest degree, so the plus or minus would be one degree, then you could use a fixed point variable. You could count minus 99, minus 98, minus 97 and so on and use a fixed point value. Because you're using a fractional value as the precision, it's probably better to use a floating point variable. The second example is the speed. I am actually counting, it's all positive. You can't really have a negative speed. And the precision is one kilometer per hour. You could just use an 8-bit integer. An 8-bit integer in a um, unsigned format can count from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to 5, 1, 1. Plenty of range for the sort of speed that you're talking about here. So that's the designer, the person that designs the software to handle some real world value. That's what they need to think about. What's the range of the value and what's its precision? There's something else we need to think about for real signals that are continuous though. So continuous is something which is changing regularly. That could be the stock market indices, or it could be the air pressure that you're measuring in a weather sensor. Or in the example shown here, it could be blood glucose level. This is actually a real example that I've looked at. And in that example, you measure somebody's blood glucose. Um, it's part of one of the possible treatments for people who have diabetes. You measure the blood glucose level, and if the blood glucose level um, needs to be taken down, then you inject insulin. Okay, I'm not an expert on diabetes, but I've looked at the application here. Um, it just means that every now and again um, blood glucose is measured. In the old days there would be a syringe and go in and take out the, the blood. Uh, more modern systems have a finger prick and you just prick your finger, a little drop of blood comes up there and you could measure the glucose level. And if the glucose level is too high, inject insulin. Really modern techniques have an implanted, embedded sensor that can actually be um, connected to you almost permanently. You stick it on your skin and it measures your blood glucose and it could measure it very frequently. Now I've got two scenarios shown on this slide. First of all, what's actually happening in a patient is that their blood glucose level is varying over time. It varies in response to things like exercise and the amount you drink and the amount you eat. And that glucose level is varying within ranges. Outside those ranges, it's too high or too low. It may be medically something that needs to be handled. 
Typically, you might want to sample that once a day, or twice a day, or four times a day, or maybe every two hours. And if you sample that every two hours, which is in this graph just here, we can see that the blood glucose level, every time it's sampled, is actually okay. Um, if a doctor was doing this, they would look at that patient and they would never see a reading that is a problem. But if they had a, a more, let's say, a more modern approach, or a better, um, faster method of sampling glucose, then they could sample every hour. And if they sampled every hour, we get more readings here, and we'll see that two of those readings indicate problems. So what's happening here is when you sample too slowly, the information you store is an incomplete picture. And you need to sample fast enough to suit the information that you are looking at. Um, a typical wearable diabetic monitoring system, such as the one used by ex-UK Prime Minister Theresa May, measures four times per hour. More modern systems can be implanted and they can measure every minute. So this is a real example. But it tells us about how the computer needs to sample values that are continuously changing. And you define that by a sample rate. And almost all systems that we are ever going to use, they sample uniformly. So they continuously sample at a fixed rate. That's how many times per second they sample. Some examples here, telephone speech. Telephone speech is typically sampled at 8 kilohertz. So the sample, the audio samples are sampled 8,000 times per second and that's enough to pick up speech. It's not very good quality speech, but you can understand what somebody is saying. You might not recognize them very well from that though. If you're into higher quality music, it's the same thing. It's sound, but you need to sample much faster because some musical instruments have got very high frequencies. So typically CD quality music is sampled 44,100 times per second. And the two hourly measurements we were looking at previously is two every hour and there's 60 minutes and 60 seconds per hour. So it works out to be 0 0.00014 hertz. It's a pretty slow sample rate. But for that application, it may be enough. So the sample rate depends on the application and it needs to be frequent enough to capture the variations in the signal that's required for that application. Now, if you sample too frequently, you waste power. And when you store those values, you end up filling up your memory space. So your phone would get its memory filled up in no time. So if you sample too slowly, you miss important stuff. If you sample too quickly, you waste power and storage space. So how fast should you sample? Thankfully, we have somebody called Nyquist that answered that question for us. And he said that a continuous signal ought to be sampled from a waveform if you sample at least twice as fast as the highest frequency component in that signal that you want. Okay, so the way you think of it is like this. You say, okay, that signal, that thing we're measuring, what's the highest frequency component? What's the highest, fastest changing piece of information that we want? And you identify that, and then you make sure you sample at least twice as fast as that thing changes. So if your blood glu glucose me uh, measure could be peaking every minute, then you would make sure that you sample at least twice per minute. So if the highest frequency that you're interested in that signal is F max, then you need to sample at at least twice F max. You can sample a bit faster or a lot faster if you want. And that means that you will accurately get all of that useful information from the signal when you sample it into the computer. Now, just working backwards from that, if we know the Nyquist rate, what we have to sample at is twice the frequency of the highest com uh, frequency component in the signal of interest. So the, in the signal that you want to sample, the highest frequency component 
is something you identify and you must sample twice as fast. What does that tell us about the signals that are on the screen now? I talked about telephone speech. If we're sampling that at 8,000 times per second, 8 kilohertz, well, that tells us that the highest component in the signal that we're really interested in is 4 kilohertz. And that happens to be the highest, most squeakiest sound of a voice. On the other hand, CD audio is 44.1 kilohertz sample rate. It tells us that the highest frequency component that you can ever want in a CD audio is about 22 kilohertz. Um, maybe that doesn't really follow so much. I can't hear 22 kilohertz, but some people can. Uh, most adults of my age can hear up to about 15 kilohertz only. In the past I worked on some earthquake sensors. They're measuring uh, the way the tectonic plates change and how the earth shifts and moves. Um, the earth does not move that quickly in practice, so they tend to sample at 0.25 hertz, so four times per second. That's very typical. And if you're typing on a keyboard or you're, you're pressing buttons that's connected to a computer, um, typically that will be sampled about 100 times per second. And the reason is that your, your fingers cannot possibly move faster than that. I mean, the fastest you can be at typing. You cannot outrace a computer that's sampling 100 times per second. So you sample something, and then it, it's presumably being brought into the computer, and it's represented in the computer. And this whole thing is called pulse code modulation. In the early days of computers, there were different types of modulation used, but these days we pretty much standardized on pulse code modulation for most things. And you are sampling something at a sampling frequency of Fs. Okay, that means that you're sampling Fs times per second. So what the graph at the bottom is showing is each of those samples along the x-axis okay, at time 0, time 1, time 2, time 3, time 4 and so on fs times per second and at each of those instants, at each of those points in time pulse code modulation, what it does is it takes the original signal which is shown here in green and it works out its amplitude and it sort of averages the amplitude over that time period of the green signal and then it represents that according to the coding on the y-axis and this coding is going from minus 3 to plus 8 in this instance okay now it makes sense when you look at this that you can see that the digital representation that the purple representation it sort of follows the green one. It's you know, roughly following what the green one is doing. You can see that it's got the same sort of shape overall, but it's not exactly the same. There's a bit of an error there, and that's um, called quantization error. We'll get to that in a moment. But on this graph, I want to show something about um, the effect of the y-axis on the quantization error. Now quantization is the number of discrete levels used to represent the amplitude of a signal. So there's three graphs here. Um, the one on the left has got 4-bit quantization, that's 16 levels. The one in the middle has got 3-bit quantization, that's 8 levels. And the on one on the right has got 2-bit quantization, it's 4 levels. And that really says the number of steps on the y-axis that we try to force the analog signal into. The x-axis is unchanging in these plots. The sample rate is not changing. We're keeping the same sample rate. We've already talked about that. We're using the Nyquist formula. We've got the sample rate fixed. Now we need to quantize the level at each sampling instant. And here we're trying to fit that into 16 levels. Here we're trying to fit it into 8 levels. And here we're trying to fit it into four levels. More levels, like here, it means better accuracy. The, the steps here are more close to the original signal than on this one, on the two-bit quantization. 
But of course there's twice as many bits used in the highest resolution graph. It takes more energy, more time and more storage space to sample with more bits. So it's another trade-off. So quantization defines how the value is stored in binary. A couple more examples, if you're using speech, like I mentioned, you might quantize each of those samples. Remember, it's sampled at 8 kilohertz, but you might quantize those with 8 bits or possibly 12 bits. And if you want the very best CD quality audio, you're sampling at 44.1 kilohertz, that will be sampled with 16 bits precision. So each sample, each sound sample, will be quantized to 16 bits. We've shown this for continuous values, but remember, quantization is necessary for just sampling a single value as well. That's what we started off with. Quantization defines the range and the precision. Now, most microprocessors that you're using, it doesn't matter if it's desktop PC or if it's your mobile phone or embedded system, they tend to start off with some analog data and they bring the analog data into the microprocessor and then they do something with it and output it. Um, a case in point is if you're talking on your phone, your voice is analog, it's being sampled, it's going into this phone, it's being transmitted wirelessly and at the other end that, an that uh, digital sample now is being converted back to the analog domain for somebody to listen to. The actual conversion is done by an analog to digital converter at one end or a digital to analog converter at the other end. My plot or my graph that's shown here, it shows three different scenarios. The top scenario is your microprocessor is taking something analog, doing something to it in the digital domain and outputting something analog. It's very common. Sometimes, on the other hand, you would have a, a process or you'd have a system that only takes analog values and doesn't output them again into the analog world. That could be something which is just recording or measuring values. On the other hand, we have scenarios where a microprocessor might be taking something internal and outputting it into the analog world. One example is if you have some music in an MP3 or something similar, you have a digital file stored on a device, it's all digital. The microprocessor takes that digital file, it processes it, and it uses a digital to analog converter to convert that to analog and a loudspeaker to output it for you to listen to. Um, there's a, a scenario missing here, and that's the scenario where there's no ADC or no DAC. But that doesn't really happen in practice because your microprocessor is pretty useless if it has no input and no output. So we talked about the microprocessor and storing the values. <clears throat> we talked about ADCs and DACs. The missing link here is the transducers, which are the things that convert a signal from some domain into the electrical domain. Okay, Let me back up and just say that one more time. Your microprocessor deals with digital values. Your ADC converts analog voltages into digital values. The transducer converts a thing you're measuring into analog voltages. So for sound, that might be a microphone or an ultrasonic transducer that takes some sound converts that to electrical signals which you can then sample with an ADC. At the other end, your digital values going through a digital to analog converter will be, get transformed to a voltage which an output transducer could use to create an analog value. So an output transducer that deals with sound would probably be a loudspeaker or a buzzer or maybe something like this. And in vision terms, these would be LED and LDR, or photodiode, or camera sensor. But there's many other uh, measurement devices. There's 100,000 different transducers that can plug into embedded systems. They can measure pretty much anything you ever need to measure. Blood glucose is one. Temperature, pressure, speed, carbon dioxide, and many others.
So we're not going to talk any more about transducers. It's outside of the domain of what we want to talk about, what we want to learn. But just know that they are there. They're an important part of this. So the actual analog to digital conversion itself uses a analog to digital converter with a width. We call it a width, and the width is the number of bits. So an n-bit analog to digital converter has a width of n, and it divides the input voltage into 2 to the power of n levels. So a 16-bit analog to digital converter, which is something that you'd use for audio, for music, that divides the input voltage into 2 to the power of 16 and 65536 levels. And the resolution of that is the step between levels. So if the voltage range is VREF, then the resolution is VREF divided by 2 to the power of n. And that's putting into mathematical formula what we saw a couple of pages ago with the 4-bit, 3-bit and 2-bit quantization. Now inside an ADC, as we've seen, there's actually two things happening. So it's good to just separate those in our mind. The first thing that's happening is that the input voltage is being sampled, a snapshot is taken of the current input voltage. And the second thing is happening is that that is then being quantized into a binary level. Um, there's a third thing that's not really part of the ADC aspect, but it's something that you need, and that is to get the value from the ADC into the CPU when asked. And uh, in typical terms, what would happen in reality is the CPU might ask an analog to digital converter to read a value. The analog digi to digital converter would say, OK, I'm reading a value. The CPU will go and do other things. The ADC will read a value, will sample and then quantize, and then it will wake up the CPU with an interrupt. Hey, I'm done. The CPU then needs to read that. So we'll get to that a little bit later. But first of all, here's an example of a 3-bit analog to digital converter. So with 3 bits, there's 2 to the n levels. It's 8, and I've shown the 8 levels on the left-hand side in this plot. Okay. And on the x-axis, I've plotted the, um, the input voltage. So this is not time or anything. This is just looking at the input voltage. And the green line is the input value, the input voltage. And it says that when the input voltage is 0, then the digital output is 0, 0, 0. As the input voltage increases at a certain point, the output changes to 0, 0, 1. As the input voltage continues to increase, the output voltage stays at 0, 0, 1. And then at another point, oh, I'm sorry, I clicked. At another point, the digital output becomes 0, 1, 0, and so on. So the digital output goes step, 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 step as the input increases. And it means that any input in the voltage range between these divisions, or in fact any of the divisions on the graph, gives a fixed digital output. So if the voltage is, let's say this is 3.2 volts, or 3.3 volts, or 3.6 volts, or 3.8 volts, or 4.0 volts, then the digital output would be 1, 0, 0, 0. If the voltage became 6 volts, then the digital output might be 1, 0, 1. And this is giving an idea of how it works. This is just a single sample. If you're sampling a continuous value, then you'd repeat this over and over and over again. So the biggest error, the biggest quantization error, is half of one of these ranges. So that's the that's R, the resolution. And the biggest quantization error, the biggest error between what the digital output is saying and what the actual input is, is half of a bit. Okay? And that's because the worst case is that um, 
the output is let's say here and the input is just there it's half a bit difference another thing to note is something called dynamic range dynamic range is the range between the smallest possible value that an ADC or DAC can handle and the biggest possible value and for an n-bit digital to analog converter the dynamic range is a formula of 6.0 to n plus 1.76 decibels you can derive that formula but it's not really necessary it's just something to remember if you consider some of those examples like the um, music 16-bit value we put the 16 into here and you'll find that the dynamic range is about 100 decibels and that's the dynamic range or the, the highest theoretical dynamic range you can get from CD quality audio. It's something that people use in audio and other domains to look at the quality or size of a signal. I did say that we almost always sample uniformly. I didn't say the same thing about quantization. Um, sampling is on the um, is the time base that quantization is the number of levels here and it's the size between the levels all the examples I've shown are uniform but some systems use non-uniform quantization and, and this is in particular telephone type audio that uses something called a law or mu law and the reason is is that the um, non-linear, especially logarithmic quantization, tends to be more similar to the way human senses work. So most of the human senses, whether they're sound or sight or touch, they tend to work logarithmically. Uh, as an example of a sound, if a sound becomes twice as loud, it does not have twice the amplitude. And in fact, if a sound becomes twice as loud, in general, um, it depends on the, the frequency of the sound but very loud sounds um, if the sound is twice as loud as a slightly less loud sound um, actually you may not be able to notice the difference even though there's twice as much energy there humans don't process things linearly so quite often we use logarithmic ranges so people that make ADCs and decks came to use logarithmic scaling and there's also lots of clever stuff that's going on with DACs and ADCs. Um, one example is a Delta Sigma ADC or a Sigma Delta DAC. And instead of sampling with, let's say, 65,536 levels, 44,000 times per second, they might sample 3.5 million times per second, but with only a single bit of precision. And they have some clever processing inside that means that that's actually extremely good quality. We're not going to go into that. We're not going to look at that. But it's just something that you need to be aware of because you'll see these terms, especially if you're into high-end audio. Right, we talked about analog to digital conversion. Well, the opposite is digital to analog conversion. It's exactly the same. It's, it's the reverse process, an analog to digital converter takes a voltage, measures it, samples it, quantizes it, and provides a digital output to a CPU. That same digital output can be sent to a DAC, and the DAC will take that and convert it into a voltage and output it. And the same factors apply, the same sample rate, precision, and the same Nyquist criteria, and quantization error, dynamic range, all the same things in the reverse. Now, there's some practicalities here, some things to note. Um, the first thing to note is that I talked about VREF once through this, this lecture. Now, VREF is the maximum voltage that the ADC or the DAC can handle. Um, if you're listening to a Zoom meeting and somebody is, is connected to that and you can hear them talking and it's so silent that you can't really hear them, they're very quiet. So if somebody's really quiet, it means that they haven't turned up the gain on their microphone. And that 
could mean that the VREF on their analog to digital converter is too high. So if the microphone signal is small and the VREF is very high, you won't be able to hear it. So you could turn the gain of the microphone up to make the signal higher, or you could keep the microphone signal the same and you could reduce the VREF level on the ADC so that the microphone now fills most of the, d most of the range of that ADC. So as a circuit designer you would fix the VREF. You can also have circuits where the lower voltage, I've got zero volts on here, and in all my examples I put zero volts, but actually you can have that set to a negative reference or a reference at some other voltage. So the circuit designer decides what's the voltage range that the ADC is going to ap operate at, and then within that range they divide it up by 2 to the n levels. So if you've got a 8-bit digital analog converter, you'd take those um, 512 levels, sorry, 256 levels, and that you would um, represent those across the range from 0 to VREF, or whatever the, the, the minimum and maximum is. Now if you fix that as a circuit designer, and your signal gets too high or too low, it's clipped. And in, in audio terms, clipping would make a, a sound like <coughs> that sort of sound. You can, you can tell it. Um, if I shouted, you'd probably get some clipping, but it wouldn't be very pleasant for people. Okay. And I've also mentioned this about the sampling not being instantaneous. I said that the CPU would tell an ADC to go ahead and sample. It would then go off and do something else. And then when the ADC has finished sampling, it would interrupt the CPU and say, hey, I've just sampled. And if you're sampling only a few times per second, then the CPU can do very useful things in between waiting for different sample points. Nobody in a real system has the CPU polling an ADC. In a real system, it, or at least if it's continuous sampling, a one-off maybe, but in a real system, it would all be done with interrupts. So that's covered the importance of analog, how we represent analog sig signals in a digital system. I said it's an analog world, but our computers are digital. So we need a method of representing them. We looked at sample rate, sampling, we looked at Nyquist, uh, the number of quantization levels, and we talked about PCM in particular because that's the thing that everybody uses. We looked at transducers, which are the bits that actually convert something you want to measure to a voltage or a voltage to something you want to listen or see or hear or touch. And we talked about ADCs and DACs as getting data into a digital domain from the analog or out from a digital domain to analog. And then we looked at some practicalities that are related to this. And I think that it's fair to say that there's some standard ADCs and DACs out there, but most microprocessors, they have some built-in hardware that has some variation in how it's programmed. We've looked at the generic things, we looked at the general way it works, but there'll be some detail that we need to go into when we're actually using this in the real world.